was at war. The only question was when the United States would be involved. On December 7, 1941, this question was answered. At 12.55 p.m. Evansville time, the Japanese surprised the naval base at Pearl Harbor with a devastating attack. The next day, President Roosevelt addressed the nation. Yesterday, December 7, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. His speech was broadcast United over the radio America, for all to hear. Formal classes were dismissed at Wright's High School as students and faculty and gathered around radios scattered the throughout the building. Principal M.L. Plum provided his radio so the students could listen in the gym. I was a... Uh, Nine years old, when the Second World War started, we were at my grandmother's house, and of course everything then came by radio. And I remember it just scared the britches right off of me. And I just knew the Japs were going to come over and bomb us that night, because already they had said, you know, observe blackout, and all shades were to be drawn, no light is to be shining out of the house, and all of that sort of thing. So. My entire family heard about Pearl Harbor on the radio, as did a lot of people. Living in Evansville during a time of war was quite an experience. Evansville became one of the leading war production cities in the United States. Even before Pearl Harbor, Evansville business leaders saw the economic potential government defense contracts provided. On January 4, 1942, the Chrysler plant was given a war order to employ 12,000 new workers to start manufacturing 45 and 30 caliber ammunition. On February 15, 1942, it was announced that Missouri Valley Steel would build a shipyard on the west side. The yard transformed the city, bringing thousands of workers to Evansville. The new shipyard produced landing ship tanks, ocean-going vessels that delivered tons of supplies directly onto the beaches of Europe and the Pacific. By mid-March, 45 acres of land had been acquired for the location of the new LST shipyard between the foot of Wrights Hill and Pigeon Creek. Production began on June 25, 1942. On October 31st, the first LST was launched on the Ohio. It went during there from Dress Plaza all the way around to the granary area there. And they built these LSTs, which is a mammoth boat, and we're putting it in a river, not an ocean. So when you launched it, you launched it sideways. You didn't shoot it out in the water. It, it was so big, they had to launch the boat sideways into the Ohio River, you know. And uh, I don't know how many thousands of people they hired. Lots and lots of women were riveters, welders, and so forth that wasn't normal, you know. On March 22, 1942, Republic Aviation announced that they would build a plant in Evansville to produce P-47 Thunderbolts. The P-47s were used as escort fighters for high-level bombers in the Pacific. The plant would be constructed on Highway 41 North near the airport. The building process began immediately with a round-the-clock schedule and ended in August. As the plant was being built, future employees attended war training classes at Evansville College. This allowed production to begin on September 20th, nine months ahead of schedule. In the following months, Thunderbolts undergoing test runs scattered Evansville skies. Before the war's end, the plant made a total of 6,242 P-47s. As men left for the war, their jobs were left vacant. Women were chosen as their replacements. This dramatically changed their roles in society. Before the war, their lives consisted of household duties such as taking care of children and making meals for their families. During the war, the women traded in their brooms for privet guns. With women working jobs outside of the home, they became more independent and valuable to the war effort. Some Evansville women worked building wings for the planes at Republic Aviation, and others assembled bullets at the Chrysler plant. Most women working for the war were idealized as the icon, Rosie the Riveter. My mother, who had never worked outside the home because she was married at 16, went to work at Cervell making wings for airplanes and then had a little money of her own, which 
uh, you know, after the war was over, she still wanted to have that same thing. So women were more apt to go to work then, full time. Oh, she became Rosie the Riveter. Uh, actually, all of the factories quit making uh, furniture. This was a large furniture place uh, at that time and had been since about the turn of the century. Actually, it was a 24-hour town. In other words, uh, the factories ran 24 hours a day. And so everything else uh, in the way of entertainment stayed open to it. 24 hours a day, too. As war industry quickly developed in Evansville, population increased as well. Although the population in Evansville grew, the enrollment in Evansville schools remained nearly the same. In 1940, Evansville schools enrolled 16,085 students. In 1945, 16,628 students were enrolled. This was the result of many kids going to work in factories and young men enlisting in the war. Schools were constantly contributing to the war effort. They held contests to see which classes or grades could collect the most pennies and encouraged teachers to buy war bonds. There were many different drives to collect needed items for the war, like rubber and scrap metal. The curriculum changed for many of the schools to help with the war overseas. PE classes had obstacle courses and special training for the boys. The girls also contributed by knitting and making posters to promote and support the war effort at their school. They also wrote lots of letters to the boys in the service. In addition, manual training was held at North High School to help boys sharpen their technical skills. Evansville College offered courses in engineering, science, and war management. Due to the necessity of engineers during wartime, Purdue University graduated engineers in three years instead of four. Every Monday, uh, we would bring a dime to school. And if you could afford, you could bring more naturally. And what you bought was one stamp. And that went into your war bond, your defense bond. And that bond wound up costing you $18.50. If you kept it to maturity, uh, you got considerably more back, and I just knew I'd be rich. During the war, Evansville citizens dealt with rationing. Many valued items such as sugar, butter, meat, gas, rubber, shoes, textiles, and other everyday necessities were scarce. On May 5, 1942, sugar rationing began, and it could only be bought with a stamp. The following month, 15 more items were to be rationed for the war effort. Oh, rationing, uh, that was a problem because uh, when you would hear, we had a lot of little local grocery stores then, and when you'd hear that they'd gotten something that was uh, hard to get, then there, you'd go and there'd be big lines waiting for sugar or uh, butter, or, and then uh, there was um, shoes were rationed. Uh, so I was uh, talking to a friend yesterday who said she remembered wearing house shoes to her first formal dance because she didn't, they didn't have any stamps to buy shoes with, and that was, they were kind of flat, and she could get away with that on her, with her dress. So Students were not the only ones helping with the war effort. Everyone throughout the city practiced air raid drills and held blackouts. During a blackout, every building and house turned off their lights. No source of light was to be seen. During the summer of 1942, on July 20th, Evansville held its first blackout in the Wrights Bowl. The program was called Bombs Over Evansville, which was an imaginary raid portraying the bombing of Meade Johnson Terminal and the Cervell plant. During the blackout, an area of 25 blocks in the Forest Hills District was blacked out for a period of 25 minutes. The blackout was a success, for the most part. The only lights visible were two hallways in Wrights that could be seen by the Evansville police chief. He rushed into the building and was unable to find the light switches to turn the lights off. In a hurry, he resorted to standing on a wastebasket to unscrew the light bulbs. Drills such as this were practiced so that the city would be prepared for an enemy air raid. Every block in the city had an air raid warden. Now, he may have had more than one block. I don't really remember all of that, but we had an actual air raid warden. It was his job to go around and make sure you didn't have a light shining that could be seen from out in the street because the idea was bombers coming overhead could zero in on a dot of light and 
you know, come into a bomb run. Although the country was at war, this was a great time to live in America. Family time was valued and appreciated. Many families and GIs went to Burdett Park to enjoy free time with loved ones. Families went to churches to pray for the soldiers. American pride was seen through every neighborhood with flags and men dressed in uniform. Everybody would have a flag in their window or out in the yard or uh, it was displayed every place. So um, you didn't see anybody that was against it, you know. Uh, a lot of patriotic pride. In Evansville, the war did not keep people from having a good time. While many were working hard towards the war effort, people still found time for entertainment. Seeing kids play baseball in a sandlot was a common sight for most. Without the convenience of TVs and other electronics, many students went to dance clubs and found time to volunteer in organizations such as the 4-H Club. Oh, well, we went down to, we had dances that the school sponsored, but um, uh, we went to the, what was then, we called it the USO, which isn't there any now, now uh, the four, the big pillars down on the, the river were the part of that building. Uh, we went there, it was a USO for servicemen, but on Friday nights it was high school night. So we went there every Friday night. Many football fans flocked to the Wrights Bowl to watch a competitive game. Sometimes the bowl would be full of so many people that there were no empty seats. There were other exciting sporting events throughout Evansville. Bossy High School's basketball team found great success in the state tournament, bringing home state trophies. As the war progressed, many waited with anticipation for peace to be declared. Mothers, sisters, and wives waited patiently for their loved ones to return. When the news reached Evansville that the war ended, there were people dancing and hugging in the streets. Everyone was celebrating the victory overseas. People would drag Main Street. Cars would line up the roads so that hardly anyone could move. I was coming home from work, and I don't know, it was like in the afternoon, late in the afternoon, church bells started ringing. Men were outside shooting rifles, guns, handguns, uh, firecrackers. Everybody was out in the street. Everybody was hugging and kissing one another. The VE Day, Victory in Europe. And my gosh, that was such a, it was really spine tingling even. Uh, just, you know, it was just great because everybody had somebody fighting an OR, you know, one of the theaters. From the beginning of the war to the end, Evansville experienced many changes. The population had grown and new jobs were offered. The riverfront experienced a makeover with the LST shipyard, and the Chrysler plant had increased war production. Evansville schools experienced many changes with a difference in curriculum and their participation in helping with the war effort. People's lifestyles were altered with the rationing of precious everyday items and their constant loyalty to helping men overseas. The Evansville community practiced air raid drills and blackouts to prepare for attack, knowing that there was always a chance of danger. Families stuck together, and although time seemed hard, people made sure to find time for entertainment. Evansville was united in its effort to support the war. I always felt like I grew up at the greatest period of history in this country because uh, it was just a good time to be alive and be in this world. Uh, you just... Can't, I don't think people can really imagine how unified this country was, and uh, it, was just, it was just great. <laughs>